Hey, and welcome to another On The Move, presented by Mecham Auctions and sponsored by State Farm. I'm your host, Matt Avery, and joining me is co-host John Craman, lead TV commentator for Mecham Auctions on Motor Trend. John, pretty exciting today. It is show number 80. We've done 80 of these uh, On The Moves, and there's no slowing down. Lots more in store as we move for- further into uh, season three. Now, let's talk about this show. Really exciting. Uh, you and I were recently in Las Vegas, and you and I never pass up an opportunity to stop by and see our friends at Shelby American. And uh, so you and I sat down with our our car bud, Gary Patterson, president of Shelby American, for kind of an update on what Shelby is currently working on, some future projects. So a lot of good conversation. John, why don't you remind listeners, just in case they may not be fully aware, you know, Shelby is such a storied organization, performance powerhouse. What are some of the highlights of their many decades in business? Yeah, we go back 60 years, Matt. All began back in 1962. It was a vision of Carol Shelby, and employee number one was the famed Peter Brock. And, of course, they started with the uh, Cobra. They evolved in the mid-1960s with modifications to the Mustang that evolved into the GT350. And then probably their biggest claim to fame, at least in the modern world, was the success of the Ford GT program in cooperation with Ford for the dominance of Le Mans racing in the late 1960s popularized to a whole new generation, of course, of enthusiasts with the movie Ford versus Ferrari. But it's really amazing, Matt, that they continue to go strong today, still having plenty of relevance, specifically and typically both in current generation Mustangs, trucks, and now the Mustang Mach-E also starting to get the Shelby treatment. So hats off to those guys for you know, keeping the faith all these years. <laughs> well, John, as I mentioned on the move is uh, moving forward into season three. And I do want to give a shout out. Uh, we recently sent out a survey to a bunch of our listeners. And so we want to say thanks to everyone that filled that out. That was super helpful. In case you did not get that or wondering, our survey uh, included a bunch of questions that we wanted to hear from our listeners. It covered everything from the topics that they liked hearing to some ideas for some future shows. So we got a lot of good responses. We're already making some changes based on that to hope, you know, just to make this show just more exciting for listeners. And uh, and I also want to mention for those that might be unaware, if you want to get kind of that inside scoop on that type of notification, if you head over to Meekum.com, click on the On The Move uh, podcast page. If you wait a minute, there will be a pop-up for a um, email subscription. That is something brand new that we're doing. It's basically an opportunity to communicate directly with our On The Move fans. There's going to be some exclusive content down the road that we will be sending just to them. So if you want to be part of that, like I said, head over to Meekum.com, get subscribed. It's really exciting. A A lot of cool stuff is in the works. John, let's turn our attention uh, to March. And I love how you you phrased the month ahead with Meekum Auctions. I love it. The Meekum March Madness. Uh, I, I, I think that's great. We've got three auctions, a lot's going on, and that's going to be a busy month, that's for sure. Yeah, kind of crazy, Matt. You know, um, you, we, we talk so much about... Meekum covering all the bases, uh, and we really mean it this time because not only have we got great collector cars and Meekum tradition coming up this month, but also the folks from uh, the Gone Farming Division handling tractors and farm relics and some great collections, including vintage trucks. All kicks off with Glendale, Arizona. That's the greater Phoenix area. March 16th through the 19th at State Farm Stadium, and I'm very pleased and very happy to report that we have added a third day to the television coverage. Cool. Motor Trend got a hold of us and said, hey, Hey guys, uh, due to record ratings, very proud about that, uh, with Kissimmee, the launch of our uh, re- relationship with the folks at Motor Trend, they asked if we could add an extra day. So we're kicking off 18 hours of live television coverage beginning on March 17. That would be Thursday. So you got great coverage coming Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. The Gone Farming guys uh, with their spring classic I just mentioned, March 24th and 26th. And Mecham Houston to the NRG Center actually kicked off on March 31st. It does dip into March, so it counts, and that runs through April 2nd. Consignment still being taken for that. And just a final mention as far as Mecham news, hats off to the gang. 35 years of Mecham tradition. The Indy Spring Classic, uh, mid-May, that's May 13th through the 21st. 
Uh, plenty of television coverage, obviously, coming up for that. And 3,000 entries coming to Indy, and the consignment books also open on it as well. So hopefully to carry the momentum forward that we established with not only with Kissimmee in January, but with the motorcycle auction with great success. Let's see if the momentum continues with these uh, upcoming uh, Mecham March Madness auctions. <laughs> well, John, let's turn our attention to the world of car news and the ever-changing terminology related to electric vehicles. You saw recently or you noticed uh, that automakers more and more are including or lumping in the phrase ice electric and others under the umbrella of EVs. What do you kind of take from this type of positioning? Yeah, Matt, what I'm doing is I'm just kind of really paying a lot of attention to the evolving world of mobility, politically correct <laughs> right. term. Um, and I'm seeing more and more where the manufacturers are probably not going to be able to hit their very aggressive targets for quote unquote all electric. So they're starting to spin a little bit and start to include in the EV umbrella uh, hybrids, a uh, combination, of course, of ICE, internal combustion engine, and electric power. Uh, I think, honestly, I think for a mainstream audience, I think that's a a probable good way to go as we move towards the future. And um, while we're while we're on that topic of of ICE engines in the future, interesting to note that uh, new car prices highest in history. No surprise there. Uh, over $47,000 for the new year. But I've got some good news for everybody that's listening. If you want a high-performance, conventional V8-powered car, there's lots of them available, and they're all available for well under the average cost of a new vehicle in the United States, that $47,000 target. Your choices would include Dodge Challengers, Dodge Chargers, Ford Mustangs, and Chevy Camaros of a variety of different flavors. Get your orders in. Don't be disappointed. <laughs> All right, John. Well, uh, keeping the theme on muscle cars, some really exciting movie news. And I got to say, you had caught wind of this before I did. I think I'm still kind of reeling from the news that according to anonymous sources, Deadline has reported that a new bullet movie is in the works with Steven Spielberg at the helm before we get uh, angry letters or before people get too upset. It's not a remake. If I understand what's out there, it's more of kind of a, a continuation story. Is that how you kind of read the, the news announcement? Yeah, it's funny that they put out a teaser. Obviously, the first thing that jumped out at all of us was Bullet. And our right. first thought that comes to mind is, is it going to include the famed 68 Ford Mustang GT or something with a modern version of that? Don't know much yet. I'm going to reserve my enthusiasm for the movie until we hear a little bit more about it. Um, that's such a classic. It's such an awesome movie. It's a must-see for anybody listening that hasn't seen it. Um, we do know one thing about Hollywood right now, and that is they are playing back into heritage, and we also know that history does repeat itself. So I guess I'm not surprised to hear it anxious to learn more about it any further tidbits from your radar screen on this thing well no i mean i, I think like you said it, we're living in an age where a lot of hollywood is going back you know steven spielberg just did his big west side story uh remake reboot whatever right. you want to call it so it kind of makes sense that he's probably going through kind of the archives of the greatest hits of cinema and again i i think you know sure a, a movie about the detective you know uh bullet you know, I think there's all kinds of, of threads you can go with it. My my guess, John, is that it it has to include his car. I mean, if it's going to take place, you know, within five or ten years of the story of the original movie Bullet, he's going to be driving a Mustang. So I'm excited for that. I'm also kind of wondering, who are they going to get to play, uh, <laughs> you know, the iconic, you know, Steve McQueen? What are your thoughts from who's out there in Hollywood? Anyone you would like to see in that role? I don't know, man. That is... I, I, <laughs> I'm glad I don't have to make that decision because you are treading on truly historic, iconic uh, personality there with the king of cool, Steve McQueen. So it'd be fun to keep an eye on this little project. Big project, probably. <laughs> right. Well, keeping the theme on movie cars, there's a brand new Batman movie out in theaters starring Robert Patterson as the Cape Crusader. Joining him on screen is a all-new Batmobile that's gotten a completely new design. And I got to say, John, I think it's my favorite version of the Batmobile by far that we have seen because it really looks like 
it's got some American muscle roots to it. It looks like a vintage Mopar. I think it's a great reimagining of the car from over the last couple versions of the vehicle we've seen on, on screen from being more of a military vehicle to being more of a futuristic vehicle. This kind of has a retro vibe, and I got to say, I really like it. I'm looking forward to seeing it in theaters. Um, let me ask you, from all the different versions of the Batmobile that we have seen uh, thus far in different movies, what's been your favorite? Well, I'm I'm the classic baby boomer, Matt, so it's going to have to be, without any hesitation, the original television car, the 1966 Batmobile, of course, created by George Barris and his crew there. That will always be the Batmobile in my mind. But, man, you know, here's another franchise that's really got such a strong head of steam. I think is this, not sure, but I think this, this might be this upcoming Batman movie, might debut the sixth different specific Batmobile platform, don't quote me on that, but there there sure have been a lot over the years, that's for sure. Well, from movie cars, let's talk next about British cars. Morgan has announced that for 2022, their three-wheeler model has been given a redesign and a new name to the Super 3. The three-wheeler, as the name implies, did feature three wheels, still does feature three wheels, uh, a front axle with a single wheel in the back, um, kind of a two-seat open roadster uh, deal. Now, the new version, they say, draws heavily from the jet age um, of styling and influence, and that's readily apparent. The three-wheeler definitely had more of that 1920s airplane look to it. A lot of it, the engine was exposed, a lot of chrome, big side pipes. This new one is, is way more futuristic while still appearing classic. It's got a great design to it. Under the hood is a one-and-a-half liter Ford three-cylinder producing 116 horsepower and 110 pound-feet of torque. That is paired to a five-speed manual with a top speed of 130 miles per hour and a 0 to 62 miles per hour time of seven seconds. This new Super 3 will retail for just over $56,000 uh, and arrive here in the States later this year. Um, I got to say, John, I'm pretty excited by this. I think it's neat that vehicles like this are built, obviously, in, in limited quantities, but I think it's fantastic that customers who really want that distinct motoring experience can go buy something like this from a dealer. Um, I checked Morgan's dealer locator and currently in the U.S. they have 15 dealers that uh, customers can purchase a vehicle from. So really neat to see that this type of stuff is still available on the market. Let me ask you this, John, when it comes to Mecham auctions, how often are we seeing a Morgan vehicle? Uh, I'll say not even their newest stuff, but of any vintage cross the block. Is that a regular site or, or much more rare? Yeah, pretty rare. Maybe every couple, two, three years, we happen to have one roll across. They always get my attention because in the past, Matt, they've always had a, we could say retro. Uh, that is not a pro. We could say an antique look to them, despite the fact that they're, you know, they've been fairly modern in recent years. Going to be interesting to see how this one takes that to a different level. And I guess, you know, in an era where everything is evolving and everything is changing, really glad to see that it sounds like it's going to have a conventional ice engine, at least for this particular version. That's that's my thought too, John, because with such a small vehicle, space is obviously at a premium. And it's worth noting that even with the redesign, engineers had a, a challenge about fitting everything they needed to on the vehicle. The three-wheeler had the engine um, out front. It was exposed. Um, it was not covered by bodywork, but with the Super 3 redesign, the engine is, and that actually uh, forced engineers to have to put some of the cooling, including the radiators, uh, along the body of the vehicle under what they're calling side blades. So I just point that out because clearly space is an issue um, and I don't see really any effective way to do an EV conversion of having big heavy battery packs on board such a small vehicle. So we'll have to uh, wait and see if Morgan can accomplish that or if they're going to keep to the uh, ice powertrain. All right, John, well, as we wrap up, let's give an update on one of our favorite automotive events, and that is the Muscle Car and Corvette Nationals taking place every November in Rosemont, Illinois. Managing member Bob Ashen and his team do a wonderful job of building excitement throughout the year, and the latest news is that there is a brand new display dedicated to the muscle cars that have ties to Canada. It's called the Maple Leaf Muscle Invitational, and what it is is that it is spotlighting vehicles that were either sold new in Canada 
or some of the Canadian specific models that we did not get here in the States. Now, when I say that, John, I'm sure some listeners might be confused by that or, or intrigued by that. How did that happen? Explain for us, how did the Canadian market get muscle cars that we did not here in the States? Yeah, it was an interesting phenomenon that, Matt, that some of the manufacturers decided to use platforms that were available here in the U.S., but the actual vehicles had styling and trim differences and even name differences, but yet some of the other vehicles that were sold and built up in Canada were identical to the U.S. versions. So I got my fingers crossed that uh, our buddy Bob Ashton is going to put together a real nice mix and variety of both for that event. And hey, just a final thought, um, I'm re really proud to say that my wife, Christine's 1972 Ontario Orange Fire Mist Metallic Corvette has been invited to McCacken as a participant of the class of 1972. And my three-piece classic rock band, Redline 7000, also will be back playing at McCacken. So great cars and classic rock doesn't get much better than that, my friend. Mecham Auctions is proud to bring you On the Move with Matt Avery and John Craman. For more on the world of collector cars, head over to Meekum.com. Now, let's get back to the show. John, whenever we are in Las Vegas, we always make time to visit one of our favorite places, which is Shelby American, and that's where we're at right now. And we have got the man uh, who runs this place, Gary Patterson, president of Shelby American, to fill us in on all the latest on this, uh, really the epicenter of performance when it comes to that. Absolutely, Matt. You know, we've... Uh I've been familiar with Shelby American since I was a little kid. It's been around since the early 1960s. But with Carol Shelby's passing in 2012, I'm just so proud and so honored to say that the legacy of everything that he was about, performance and innovation, is continuing on even into this present day. And the guy that's really responsible for that is Gary. And Gary's here with us right now. Gary, thanks so much for having us here. It is always a pleasure not only to see you, but to visit the facility. I gotta ask you, I've always wondered about this. Tell us how you first met Carol Shelby and when that was, and how did you get involved with his business venture? Well, it's interesting, you know, um, I got with, uh, the first time I ever met Carol was probably 1986. Okay. Um, I was at a Shelby convention uh, as yeah. a participant. Okay. So a fan. I, yeah, I was a fan, you know. <laughs> I mean, I, you know, I never grew up, so we won't use that word. But, you know, in my younger years, I, I certainly spent a lot of time. You know, my father was into cars, and, you know, we had, uh, you know, a high-performance Mustang convertible when I was young. He actually had, before that, uh, 57 Olds J2 convertible, which is the 389 with or whatever that 394 with the triple carbs. triple carbs, yeah. The yeah the three two barrels. So I figured you'd know that, John. But <laughs> Matt, maybe maybe not so much for you. But but anyway, I'll pick on Matt. But um, yeah, you know. So I was an enthusiast from the very beginning. So I can still remember the rally pack going to 7,000 RPM between the shifts, and you know, Dad was enjoying himself, a mechanical engineer. So oh. you know, there was that. And, it, and so that led me to my first basic car, which he helped me find, um, which was a 69 Mach 1 with a 428 Cobra Jet. Shaker first car? Course. First car out of the gate. So, you know, oh, wow. there was a conversation <laughs> over that because, um, you know, Junior was um, a very heavy right foot on everything. <laughs> so from tricycles to bicycles to dirt bikes, um, I ran everything wide open. And uh, so the, the 428 was going to get run wide open. And so there was some concern about that, but I also took very good care of all my stuff. Okay. So it was well-maintained and well-cared for. And, uh, you know, and I kind of lived my life, uh, you know, flat to the floor. So that's uh, kind of how it happened. But in 1986, um, you know, I'd gone to that, um, I'd gone to the uh, Shelby Convention in uh, Dearborn, Michigan. And we lived in Ohio. And uh, that the track portion was... Um, at uh, Mid Ohio Sports Car Track, great track, yeah, great track, and uh, technical, tight, and fun. Good, yeah, a good friend of mine, uh, you know, he he tagged along, and uh, we swapped cars throughout the weekend. He had a '68 GT500 KR. Oh, and uh, he was uh, in the early stages of um, MS and stuff, so um, uh. you know that was difficult for him. So I got to drive more. Um, and he's still a great friend today, so we're very fortunate that, that he's well. But, Good. you know, so I saw Carol from a distance, you know, as one of those. And then you kind of shake his hand, and then you're just 
you blend in with the crowd like everybody else. And so, you know, that whole thing just never really saw him much after that, you know, periodically once every couple of years, but it was purely as an enthusiast and never dreamed that this was even possible. Cause you know, really in the eighties, Carol was a dying man and there right. was no car company other than, you know, he'd done some stuff with Dodge in the eighties, but there wasn't, um, you know, it just really didn't seem to be a big future. And, um, you know, um, so, you know, here we are. So, uh, after you realized that he was a real guy and he was approachable, how did you two guys connect and how did you end up to be eventually be the chief of Shelby American? So, you know, um, you know, life happens and, and I was (laughs) always involved with, with, you know, the Mustang thing. And I was, you know, president of Mustang Club of Las Vegas and some of those kind of things. And I got into open road racing and I was on the board of directors and I was a, you know, the silver state classic challenge. And you probably have heard of that. You know, oh yeah. Car enthusiast. Yep. And so, yeah, I was a nutcase that kind of helped run that whole thing and the event director and, and those kind of things. And, uh, you know, late nineties and early two thousands and helped start the Sand Hills open road challenge in Nebraska. So I was really a nutcase with, with cars and performance and, and I just really stayed connected in that whole thing. So in doing so, um, we got wind that uh, Carol Shelby was moving his operation to Las Vegas. Okay. And uh, it really wasn't much of an operation at that point because the continuation cars had just been kind of birthed, if you will, um, 1995 and um, 19, late 94. So Carol moved here mostly in 95 and um, Don Rager had run that. And so he came and we invited him to be a speaker at the Mustang Club. Oh, okay. And so uh, Don spoke and, and so forth, and we became fast friends. And then he got into the open road race thing just by displaying cars. And yeah, guess what? I was involved in that too. So <laughs> one thing leads to another, and it's about relationships and people. And that's really what, what, makes, things, um, what makes things tick in the business world as well, and right. especially with us as, as an enthusiast. So, you know, um, we became fast friends. My uh, career took a change, and I was going to move, actually, from Las Vegas uh, back to southern Georgia and uh, I was in retail distribution so totally not related to cars but you know my heart my soul my my passion was always in the cars and so you know I stayed connected and when I went in to say goodbye to Don he looked at me with that look in his eye and he <laughs> goes you can't leave and I go well I got two boys to think about because I was a single parent and, and uh, raising those guys and I was like yeah but you know I got bills to pay and stuff and he goes you know, we're a small company. This might last three months. It might be pretty cool in six months. He kind of showed me a drawing of a series one that was really crude. And he said, might be something really cool if you would be interested. And I'm like, I was really well known in the retail distribution world and, 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 um, had done well with that. But, um, I knew that I would never get another chance to do this. Right. And so I went from, supervising hundreds of people to looking at this thing in the mirror and going, are you going to ship this box or not? And, you know, learning where to find Cobra parts. And, uh, you know, just basically I knew I could follow my passion. And if all went in the toilet, guess what? I could get back into the distribution business and uh, yeah. and make that work. So I did that. And uh, I took that chance. And that was uh, over 25 years ago now. And I uh, never looked back. Wow. Get us up to speed, Gary, with what all does Shelby American do currently? What are the products that they're offering? So, yeah, today, you know, the good old days are today, I think, because we got the old stuff, we got the new stuff. Um, It couldn't be better. And I was very blessed, uh, as well as a couple other team members here. But, um, you know, I I spent the first 16 years at Shelby working for Carol Shelby. Mm -hmm. And so over time, you know, I was in the background for a lot of it, but Um, you know, then I, you know, as my responsibilities increased and so forth, I had more time with Carol. And so I realized and got to spend some time with him and knew how he thought and, you know, kind of the thought process of what, you know, where he saw automobiles going. And, you know, Carol was a guy that, you know, it was, it was amazing when you, when you put him in the museum or something and you'd say, okay, Carol, what's your favorite? It was always the next one. And when you think about it in life, that's the right answer. 
it's always the next one. It's what are you doing next? It, he wasn't all focused about, you know, what he'd done in the past. That was important. But from a driver's standpoint, I look at it and I tell people this, you know, I look at this from driving. So the windshield's big and that's where your future is. You're moving forward constantly hmm. and you better pay attention out the windshield. The rear view mirror is important, <laughs> but it's small. If you focus all your time hmm. looking in the small rear view mirror, you're going to crash. You better spend time looking forward. And Carol did those things. And I tell people that. I said, you know, in life, you've got to look forward. The, the, the stuff you did, the journey you've taken, all great stuff. Need to make memories. Um, you know, and what we're doing today is that. You know, it's a, and it's part of enjoying the journey, not the destination. So we're doing that at Shelby. And what we found from Carol was, in looking at the next one, he was also a very... He, he wasn't afraid to try. He wasn't afraid to fail. He wasn't afraid to take risks. You know, nobody talks about Thomas Edison's failures. They right. talk about what he did. They don't talk about Carol Shelby's failures. They talk about what he did. You know, they don't talk about the fact that J.C. Penney went bankrupt numerous times before he was successful. So did Henry Ford. You know, failures, as long as you maintain a positive go forward attitude, are just learning experiences. Well said, yeah. And, and Carol was very much that way in his life and how he ran, you know, the company. And we run the company like that today. We certainly, you know, appreciate the past. We celebrate the the, the legends and the legacies, but the legacy continues because of all of us. And I'm saying us. It's you, John. It's you, Matt. It's in the enthusiasts, the, the people that buy these cars, that drive these cars, or maybe they don't even own one, but they aspire to have one. Right. It's the guys that work in the shop. It's the gals that work up front that, you know, do the, all of this is part of the legacy that keeps it to continue. And when we looked at Carol and look at what he did, we had a Cobra here that ran on hydrogen. Okay. We had one car. It was awful. It was, a, it didn't wow. work. You know, that's not to say hydrogen won't work someday, but in 2003, when he did this with the University of California and Jim Heffel and those guys, it, it was an experiment. We tried it. It didn't make sense at the time we moved on. That doesn't mean that hydrogen won't be a future right, at some point. Yeah. But Carol was all about that. You know, many people don't realize that, you know, he was very involved with Indy and stuff, and that's where we, you know, obviously lost, uh, you know, Davey McDonald and some of those guys. But, but you know, he was always there, and he was he was interested, and he fielded two turbine cars. Never put in the race because he figured out right at the end, at the last minute, that the two cars that he had produced wouldn't pass tech. Um, they were probably a little hotter than uh, the <laughs> rules uh, might have. Uh, uh, allowed so he withdrew the entries but you know I've got a little Hot Wheels car that's a you know little Hot Wheels and it's a Shelby turbine car and it's so those things you can actually you know look it up online there's it's a real deal but Carol was into you know turbines he was into you know the hydrogen we had a we had him on film in 2011 saying you know how excited he was about future powertrains and he specifically calls out electric Interesting. And and so for all the people that think, you know, well, wow, Carol Shelby wouldn't have tried this, they don't really know him that well because, okay. quite frankly, Carol Shelby would have tried just about anything if he thought there was a, a possibility. And so when we look at product today, you know, he used to say, Carol, I'm Carol Shelby and performance is my business. business yeah, famous okay, line. You guys remember that. So we're Shelby today and performance is our business. And we continue that legacy with those things. And we, we focus the company on four Ps. And I call that people because people are the most important asset that we have in any company. And it's no different at Shelby American. People are what's going to make this work. And, and it's not only the people that build them, it's the enthusiasts, it's the owners and all that. Pride in workmanship. Pride in everything that we do is the second P. And... 
you know, Carol was very proud of the guys in the 60s. He was very proud of what we did here. He was proud of the Shelby Series 1 that we did in 1999, mm -hmm. the only ground-up car. Um, but he was proud to, to, and also really, he was like it was back home when he got back with Ford Motor Company and, and uh, started that whole thing back again. And he was the chief tech advisor of the Shelby GT program uh, for the 05, 06 program. And he was... You know, they finished their first car in 02. We had it here for a little while. And uh, really neat. And so Carol was very involved again with Ford Motor Company. And that relationship has, you know, certainly blossomed once again um, over the years since then. And, and so, you know, as we develop new cars and new products, and we, we don't just say cars anymore, it's performance vehicles, because trucks have since you know 2013 we got back into trucks because you could say well we had a dodge pickup in 1989 which we did made 1500 of them mm -hmm. not that i would know right you guys <laughs> yeah. know that. you're in the auction business. Yeah. but uh, we did those but we got back into the truck business and you know back then it was like man you know these trucks are like eighty thousand dollars who's gonna buy one of those yeah Surprise. they were pretty hot <laughs> yeah and by 2015 we had a lot more people and then we, we expanded that product line within the truck. So Shelby F-150 at the time was a raised truck. It was competent off-road. It was competent on-road. You could take it to the country club. You could take it across, chase cows in the field. I actually did that in Nebraska. It was kind of fun. <laughs> um, but you can take your $100,000 Shelby truck and chase cows with it if that's what you want. Um, but what we find is that people really, really enjoyed the trucks. And so we, we sold those and we still sell those. Um, but some people wanted to tow heavy. So now we've got a F-250 and it's raised and we call it the Super Baja because it's like, oh, okay. it's just yeah. bigger than anything else that we've got. And it's got the big 6.7 turbo diesel in it and, and so forth. So, you know, we've expanded the product line in trucks to five different ones. We've got a little performance truck, kind of like the old Ford Lightning that was you know it's 775 horse single cab short box zero to 60 in 3.45 seconds holy cow yeah i mean that's faster than any of the muscle cars we had in the 60s you know <laughs> yeah. it's you know so the good old days are today you can have all these things and so you know we, we've done those kind of things but we still do the iconic uh, continuation cobras um you know we're experimenting with a lot of different things uh, different powertrains just like carol what and so I'm really proud of the, the team here. Um, and we can get into that stuff if you and you, Matt, uh, you know, John and Matt, you guys want to talk a little bit more about that, we can do it. So. Let's, uh, let's finish checking off the list of everything you guys are doing. You mentioned the continuation Cobras, still right. very, very popular. Big part of what you do. You mentioned trucks. Um, Mustangs for a long time have been another one of the big parts of what you do. Uh, and then something new in the electric world that we're just starting to kind of catch wind of that you guys are up to. But if you bring us up to date on where you're at with Mustangs right now. So Mustangs are really cool, and it is, you know, clearly part of the DNA of our company. Um, got into that, obviously, in, you know, late 64, I introduced uh, 65, the GT350. It went on to win B production national championships. Uh, a lot of people don't realize our Shelby GT won national championships in privateers' hands, and uh, F stock in, uh, you know, 07, 08, um, you know, those kind of time periods. So, mm -hmm. you yeah. know, we've got a good history even with the newer stuff of some of those kind of things. So Mustang's a big deal. Um, we've licensed the name uh, GT350 in 2015 and then uh, GT500 off and on um, since 2007 uh, with Ford Motor Company. And so they, you know, primarily engineer and build those cars and they've done such a fabulous job. And Carol would go there and he would talk to the engineers and he'd, you know, drive the cars and scare the crap out of everybody because he couldn't see well. <laughs> he had macular degeneration and trust me, you know, I got over the fact I could ride with Carol Shelby on a track pretty quick because I realized he couldn't see. So I let Vince do those things. So, uh, But I did ride with him a few times. It was kind of like, oh, just turn here, Carol. Okay, just tell me where to turn. Ah, uh, but anyway, but and he wasn't afraid either. I mean, the speedometer would go all the way. But um, <laughs> he could see know, the so, speedometer apparently. Yeah, and he would do donuts in the parking lot. He'd do donuts in the building. Um, <laughs> so you know, he was a character. We would do the same things, but you know, that was a little different when you're not 80 and can still see. So 
uh, little little things like that. But the Mustang thing was always a big deal. And so those cars, especially when you look at the, the 350 that Ford's really did a super job with and the R models and then the new 500 is just like unbelievable. So then it's like, well, what do you do with that, right? Uh, in 07, you know, they came out with the, the Shelby GT500 and it was 500 horse and yep. it was 5.4 liters and it was supercharged and oh my God, in 2007, oh, what are you going to do? So we put wheels and tires and brakes and suspension and we changed the hood and, you know, we made it uniquely Shelby and we put a, a big supercharger on it. We got 725 horses in 2007 and the thing went uh, let me get this right. 1087 at 134. It's impressive. Uh, and it was published in a magazine. Uh, Evan Smith drove it for uh, Mustangs and Fast Forward. So what are you going to do? And so then now, you know, you got this 2020 GT500 that's 760 horses from the factory. Yeah, we're over 900 now with the new KR. And, you know, we haven't run the numbers on it yet, but they're going to be great. You know, so we're still... We're still, you know, I call it a hybrid because it burns da- gas and rubber. <laughs> okay. Um, and I like okay. that. We got to remember know, that. Yeah. So, you know, and, and that's what the guys used to ask me and when we used to go to the auto shows. Well, where's your hybrid? I said, well, they're all hybrids. They burn gas and rubber. Some people see the humor, some don't. <laughs> um, <laughs> our do. customers see the humor. Um, that's who our customers are. But you had talked about, uh, John, a little bit of the electrification, and we came out with... Um, you know, Ford came out with the Mach-E and a Mustang Mach-E. And there was a lot of controversy over that and the naming and so forth. And, um, you know, I can tell you, you know, like I mentioned earlier, Carol was all about um, new powertrains and electric. And we knew that he'd be chips all in and he'd be in it with both feet. And so that's what we've done. And um, so we showed up at SEMA with a car that was a concept. And for those of you that saw it. I did. It's Yeah. That, you saw it? It was cool. Yeah. yeah. So strikingly different was the front end appearance. Yep. Okay. And and the design. And you'd say, okay, that's pretty crazy. In addition to looking crazy, it was also very functional. So if you look at the Daytona Coupe, if you look at a GT40 from the 60s, -hmm. if you look at a Shelby Series 1, all of those had a unique feature where air came in through the nose, goes through the radiator, and exits back out over the hood all of the year pretty cool why would you do that well reduces lift at high speed it adds efficiency to the cooling right and so you've got stability you've got efficiency and cooling well why do you need that with an electric car well guess what they got radiators too they've got a cool motors they've got a cool batteries they've got a cool cabling so there's radiators in these cars. So that car was also the design element that we put into it was also very functional. And it goes back, you know, nearly 60 years with our company oh, yeah. in that design aspect. And if you look at, you know, some of our competitors, the new Corvettes and things like that, a lot of the air comes through the nose and now exits out over the hood. Oh, remarkable that that came out, right? <laughs> Gee, you know, I think that came out in the C7. They started doing some of the, you know, but, you know, we've been doing it for nearly 60 years. And Peter Brock came up with that, you know, with the Daytona Coupe design. And other people had done that design a little bit, too. But Peter was just brilliant with uh, those kind of things. And when they came out with the Daytona, Carol was always, you know, talking to his air, you know, aerodynamic buddies because he was all involved with the air force and trained fighter pilots in world war ii and so forth and it was like well you know so he'd bring in the expert after he had peter design the car and peter had done a lot of studying and stuff like that and the experts would say you know that's a dumb idea kid because he was in his 20s and they didn't think it would work well they were aerodynamic experts making things fly in the air this car needed to be on the ground and fly. So it needed to stay on the ground and work, and Peter did a fabulous job, and they went out and set records at Riverside right out of the gate. You know, Phil Remington, all these kind of... So part of my reason for bringing those things up is once again, you know, back in the day and currently today, it's about the team of people that we've put together that Carol was always good at at choosing and picking because people are what makes this thing happen. It was the Fell Remingtons and the Peter Brocks and the Ken Miles. Those guys make it work, you know. 
Um, it, it wasn't just Carol Shelby, and it's not just Gary Patterson today. <laughs> Gary, what's the timeline for that Mach E? So we'll see. We're, what we've done is we did the, the design elements and some performance aspects, knowing, you know, in doing some, some confidential things with, the, with Ford Motor Company, so I can't really discuss a lot. But let's just say we're working on the powertrain side of it okay. right now. And how do we develop that? How do you do things that are – and we'll take bites of the apple – and uh, we'll, we'll get better all the time. And, you know, we've been running them at the track. We've been testing different things. And this does this thing well, and it doesn't do this thing well. And, um, you know, so we, we know the strengths. We know the weaknesses. We know where we should be able to play. And hopefully technology will continue to evolve over time. And when it does, we'll be there. Well, we had a conversation before we began the, cod, the podcast in regard to not only how well in today's collector car world the vintage Shelbys are doing, but how strong the contemporary Shelbys are doing as well. And certainly Meekum Auctions, being the world's largest collector car auction company, has had extraordinary success in the sale of a variety of Shelby products, including a lot of late model Shelbys. Uh, and we, we noted and we talked about that we both have noticed sort of a shift in the demographic a slightly younger buyer getting involved that seems to have an appeal for both the vintage Shelby's and the contemporaries, not one or the other, but both. What are your thoughts on that? And has that surprised you as you've watched this market evolve and get even stronger than it's ever been? Yeah, John, I think uh, you and Matt brought up a good point and <clears throat> we had talked about it briefly before, but you know, it's, it really hit home here when the 2007 GT500 came out because what we saw was you know the 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 vintage uh, guys were looking at 40 years of pent up demand where they really didn't have a Shelby other than you know arguably you could say well we had the Dodge cars and the Shelby series one but there really wasn't you know the Mustang recognized you know brand thing that went with it because all those cars were great I mean the Dodge cars were great in their day the series one was you know problematic but actually won contests against turbo Porsches and Ferraris and things like that. Yeah. My favorite potential customer actually owned those because I could beat their butts at the track with a <laughs> supercharged series one. But my point is 2007 just seemed to the light bulb went on in people's minds that they could buy a Shelby Mustang for the first time in 40 years. Yep. And so they bought the 07 to go with the 67 that they had in their garage. And that whole thing yep. continued for about the next five years. And then a funny thing started happening. Those cars were all bought. Those, you know, people had the, the new one to go with the old one now. And what we saw was a change. And the change was the, the, the people in there, and there's people, because there's more and more gals getting into this too, it's kind of cool. The, the people in their late 30s to early 50s were now buying the new car first. Okay, yep. They didn't have anything to put in the garage with it. They bought the new car first. And what they found was this was exciting. This was fun. This thing was fast. This thing was all that it was advertised to be. And then they got involved with the people and they realized that some of the people that owned these also owned these old ones. And then they learned more about the, the legacy and, and the history of Shelby American. And they liked it and they enjoyed it. And they bought the, the old ones to go with the new one. And that has yep. really, really been happening more and more all the time now is we're seeing the, the, these people men and women uh the last time we had the shelby bash we had a lot of women in the uh you know learning how to drive the car at the track right, and right. they didn't come with their husbands they came by themselves which was pretty cool Indeed. or they had husbands that were doing other things <laughs> right. but either way we're seeing a lot of that so we're seeing the younger people get involved and now with the the electrification and things like that we're also seeing we're fishing in a whole new pond people that may have never owned a ford may have never owned a um a mustang now they're fishing in this pond well let's look at this new thing because it's like a computer on wheels so we're, we're attracting a whole new 
group of people and then you know the whole truck thing and the off-road thing and that's smoking hot right now so um you know we've evolved and i think carol would be looking down just going this is killer man (laughs) so we've you know that's what's really made it work so gary one of the uh, other new products that ford has we talked about maki but of course they have another new product that's sensational everyone is eating it up and that's the the big bronco not the bronco sport but the two and four-door bronco does shelby have anything that works with that is that something that you guys are looking at to add to your your portfolio of products well matt you know like like (laughs) we've been talking about we look at all those kind of things and you know we're we're car enthusiasts but that also goes to trucks it goes to vehicles i mean you look at you know myself i like the fast motorcycles i like fast boats i like anything that's like a toy so certainly we're looking at bronco and we're looking at you know what we can do but you can't even get them in any kind of quantity right now so can't really put a lot of time and money into that just yet until you can get a you know a group of those that you can actually do but you know we are driving and we are looking at them there's a there's a little teaser video that we did at uh, Hallett Motor Speedway uh, with uh, uh, kind of cool uh, uh, Shelby um, she she drives for Ford and does the off-road stuff and so we did a little spoofy you know teaser video last june and i'm racing her with a new gt500 signature edition on the road course and we take off from the starting line of course i smoke her you know go into the first turn and i'm you know i'm leading and then she of course cheats and goes off road and cuts off major parts of the track so that in the end you know after she did this like three times eh, she goes across the finish line just in front of me where I blow by her at like 40 miles an hour faster. But it's kind of, it's just a fun, and it was a Bronco, and it is a GT500, and it's Shelby having fun, and Shelby hard on the gas. And so it was, um, yeah, so we're looking at all those things. We're looking at the different off-road things because off-road is extremely big. Yeah. And so we're parts, so we look at Shelby Performance parts and what we offer, and, and you know, but before we go out and offer, you know, Vince and I, we go out and test and we could break stuff. Carol used to say, Patterson, you could break an anvil. <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't the idea, but at least, you know, you chase the thing and you know what breaks and then you fix it and you chase it again and you fix it. And so that hopefully by the time our vehicles come out, we probably push them harder than you will. And you know, there's a good chance that, you know, most people will find a, a very good thing. I mean, there are those people that are foolish and think they can jump the Grand Canyon with their new Shelby F-150, and you can break them. <laughs> um, you know, uh, you can clearly do that. And, uh, you know, they're not indestructible. They're still vehicles. But, you know, you've got a pretty good chance. We sold some over in Dubai, and we realized that the guys are taking around deep sand, and they're running, you know, wide open throttle low speed you know climbing and our cooling system was not up to that oh you know the transmission get too hot the engine would get too hot so we put a cooling system in and it was crazy expensive but you know what you could take it in 120 degrees and run it wide open and that was an option we don't put that in all of them because it was very expensive but you know, we proved that you could actually do that. And we did some testing right out here in uh, Nevada. We happen to have hot weather here. Um, yeah. And uh, so, you know, we happen to have deep sand here. And so we take it out and we run it. And we said, oh, yeah, it goes into limp mode right away. Okay, so what are we going to do about this? We, you know, we continue to develop. We continue. And then we share information not only internally, but we share with the Ford guys. And that helps make product better. Racing, historically, has helped make streetcars better. Disc brakes and all those were developed in racing. Um, so, and a lot of different things. So I think, uh, you know, that's kind of where we're at. Gary, uh, speaking for all the car fans out there, the legacy of Shelby American began about 60 years ago. And it's very clear from kind of getting up to date with you today that the future of Shelby American and performance is in very good hands. And I just want to mention that we're right now sitting in the heart of the Shelby American Heritage Center here at your facility in Las Vegas, which is open to the public. 
uh, folks visiting Las Vegas, this should be a number one stop. It's an incredible well-stocked gift uh, shop as well. And uh, your folks and the staff here are accommodating. It's free to get in. But you've done something a little bit different. I see that there's a VIP tour that you're offering here now. Give us some highlights of what that's all about. Yeah, so we did, uh, we were doing tours for a while, but really what people wanted was a little more behind the scenes. Okay. So, and they wanted a guided tour where they could, uh, you know, talk to some people about, you know, not only the history and what, what happened and, you know, look at these legacy cars that we have and continuation cars, um, and, and then go on up through the, the progression of Shelby through the years and, and so forth. But then go on the other side of the wall and even though you have to stay behind another little pony wall you the can magic happens actually go out and look in the factory and see that it's a whole lot more than just stickers and scoops right um you know we've gone out and designed you know hoods and fenders and you know we've tested stuff and made sure that they were functional and we've really you know i think um we've upped our game quite a bit um in making sure that you know those things are also functional and and so you know brakes wheels tires it's just we've tested them we've done them um so yeah it's easy to put stickers on it's a whole lot different when you have to you know get in the game so um and the, the good thing is you mentioned earlier john and matt is that uh you know the the, the legacy cars the the older ones are bringing big money at the auctions and yeah. become auctions and and all over and yep. uh those are great but the new ones are too i mean the 2020 bold edition super snake um, you know, that guy practically, you know, doubled his money in a couple of years, which, and that's on a new car. Um, you know, the magic continues, the, the value continues. Um, you know, cars are hot today in general, but Shelby's are smoking hot. <laughs> you talked about how a lot of your contemporary shoppers are being drawn into the new products and then kind of falling in love with the history and heritage of Shelby and his work. You guys also had a big bump uh, in media attention with the big Ford vs. Ferrari movie a couple years ago. What are some other resources uh, for people that want to learn more about Carol, his life, his work, in addition to coming here, like John said, in addition to seeing that movie, what else are some ways that people can learn more about what he did and what he was all about? Yeah, and I think, you know, the, the movie was wonderful because it really introduced why Shelby is so relevant today. You know, there's a lot of the young and, and people that are 50 plus, they, they got it because they kind of lived it in the time period. But the people that are younger than that, they may not have realized the, the really deep legacy and what, what uh, was involved in that. And the, the movie, even though it really only took place over arguably about a year and a half period of time, um, it introduced really what was so hot about you know, Carol Shelby and Ford Motor Company and what was going on in the world and David and Goliath and Ferrari versus Ford. And I mean, it was a great storyline. Yeah, it was enhanced for Hollywood. If you want to, <laughs> if you want to go, okay, well, you know, Ken Miles and Carol Shelby didn't duke it out in the front yard with his wife watching in a <laughs> lawn chair and the groceries going. I mean, you could pick it apart. But could I see Carol? I think, you know, Matt Damon did a great job of Carol Shelby. And I, I was really surprised, quite wow. frankly, because I didn't think he could pull it off, but he did. He did. And could I see Carol, you know, like throwing some bolts in the in the Ferrari pit? Oh yeah. Yeah. Whether that <laughs> yeah. steal the stopwatches? Yeah. Oh yeah. Did it actually happen? I don't know. But could I see it happen? Knowing Carol's personality and gotten to work with him the last sixteen years of his life. Yeah, that could happen. So I think they got that right. The in so you know, if you look at the the movie and you get that kind of feeling and then you can say, OK, but where is it going today? And to answer your question, Matt, there's a lot of information. There's videos out there. There's all kinds of stuff um, that is available in, the, in here. You can get, you know, some of those videos, you can get books, you can get all kinds of stuff. A lot of stuff is historical, but there's more and more stuff that's starting to come out on, you know, what it is that we are doing today. And we've built, you know, a heck of a lot more cars in the last 15 years than, than we ever did in the sixties. And, you know, you look at that window and it was pretty short, 62 to arguably 70, if you include the licensed cars. So, uh, and then you know, we did the Dodge cars and we did the, uh, the Shelby series one, but, um, you know, we've done a lot more of these cars now. And, um, you know, the good old days are today because you can have the old and you can have the new and you can enjoy them both. 
Yeah. And URL for Shelby American is at shelbyamerican.com? Yes. Okay, so if uh, listeners, if you're on a digital environment, go there. If you're anywhere near Las Vegas, be sure to come here and yeah. uh, be sure to keep out for what you guys have in stores. Exciting. Clearly, you guys are not only celebrating where you've come from, but also looking ahead. Gary, really appreciate the time. And I know John and I are looking forward to seeing what else you guys have in the works. Thanks so much, Gary. Appreciate oh, yeah. it. Bye. We're working on the next one. You've been listening to Meekin Presents On The Move, brought to you by State Farm. For more information, visit Meekin.com. And join us again next time as we take you inside the world of muscle and collector cars and more.